Good afternoon and welcome to Repair University Live. So we are super excited about the show. I've been looking forward to this one since we released what the schedule for this year was going to be right back in December. Yeah. Uh, Mark, welcome back. Well, I'm good to be back. Ah, <laughs> we've been away for a while. Uh, Larry said you were in court over a speeding ticket. Was that? Uh, not quite a speeding ticket, but I was in court. Yeah. How'd it go? I was being paid. All right. And <laughs> my side won. Ah, there you go. Yep. That's all that matters yep. as long as there's a win in the pocket. So we've got a lot to cover today. Um, just a few, a few background on the principles of this show. So over the course of the last couple of years, you've probably all at some point seen one of the three of us on a Facebook forum or on a post somewhere talking about um, positions on using or not using used components and that it's not really about an OEM position statement. So we have always said that, you know, if you're pushing a position statement across the table, you're already at a losing place for negotiations. A lot of people have wondered kind of what do we mean by that? So that's what this whole show is about. Yeah, it's all about We're the why. The why. Yeah, yeah, not the what, it's the why. And we're gonna break that down. So guys, let's just start with a premise. Uh, we have a car that has come in the shop and we know it needs a quarter panel. Yep. So it's not a repair or replace issue at this point. It is a definite, this car needs a quarter panel. So right away, I'm going through some thought processes as an estimator. So I wanna be real clear throughout the course of this, there's a lot that you're gonna see that really is on the head of the estimator. This has nothing to do with the technician in the no, shop. Not yet. Um, this is all on the estimator, <coughs> making the repair decisions, building that repair plan. So um, guys, let's go real quickly through what some of those questions are that we start asking. Well, I mean, you're looking at it and it needs a quarter panel, we yep. know that. And so, first of all, what's it made of? You know, is it aluminum, is it steel, is it, you know, whatever it's made of. High strength, uh, low grade high strength steel or a mild steel. You know, yeah. uh, I don't think we to have too car? many composites left on nope. the couple of the supercars, but that's really about it. Right. Yeah. And then what does the OEM say? And that, you know, we kind of got to default to that. What does the OEM say? How's it attached? Can we section it? All these different things. Yeah. we got to know now. Yeah. So let's be clear. It doesn't really matter what part I start with. So in, in the world of collision repair, if we have, let's say, technically three grades of parts, right? We have a used part, we have an aftermarket part, and we would have an OE part. Yep. Regardless of our, all of our personal opinions. Yep. We can't do anything to the car that would deviate from the OE replacement procedure. Yep. So that's where we have to start first is what does the OE say? Um, hey, why is it important to know what that panel attaches to? I mean, a quarter panel's not structural, it's just a piece of mild steel. Does it matter what <coughs> well, knowing what it attaches I, to? I, I completely disagree with the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety for even coming up with a, a blanket statement on their, their cosmetic panels because I know of four OEMs that specifically say they are structural components. Um, Audi goes as far as almost anything you change on an Audi uh, has to go on the uh, on a bench, including the quarter panels, including let's say the A8 or the R8. The R8's bolted on, the A8 is welded on, but it's a space frame. So you would think a space frame, the quarter panel wouldn't be uh, um, a bearing right. on the collision damage, but it has, still has to go on a bench. So these are the things you need to take a look at <coughs> from the OEMs, from training, from the information, like you said before, the why. Yep. Why do I have to do Not just because somebody says so. It's almost like when we go to court, the Ipsy Ditzik rule. It's not true because I said so. I have to prove why doesn't it's work. true. It doesn't work. The, the judge doesn't want to hear that from you. Uh, just because you say it doesn't make it true. You need to prove or have documentation to back it up. Um, the biggest thing that I see, and I'll, I'll pick out two major companies, is somebody like um, uh, Mopar, where they do weld bonding from the factory and we have to put it back on a weld bonding process. So that basically eliminates any used component whatsoever. And uh, they even say, if we didn't weld bond it from the factory, we want you to weld bond it in the repair process. Yep. They don't want to hear anything about it. Um, BMW uses weld bonding on a lot of their stuff or just regular resistance welding. But in the aftermarket field, we have to put uh, a rivet bonding on a lot of their stuff on their outer panels. Uh, um, and that's that's their requirement. So there's two major companies right there that kind of like automatically push it out of the way. I mean, we'll get into later on the size of some of the holes that you have to make uh, to actually get a panel off versus what they require to do a mag plug weld, let's say. Yeah, so it's really important to know as you go through this list of questions that you're asking yourself, kind of as an estimator, a blueprint or a damage assessor, whatever term you want to use, 
before I start making decisions, before I <coughs> even head to the OE website to start looking up. These are all the questions that I want to ask myself. And knowing what substrate's behind that panel, even though that quarter panel may identify as mild steel, if it's attached to a piece of high strength steel, yeah. well, it's a whole new ball game. It's going to change how we attach it exactly. to the car. Exactly. So, so it's not just a matter of, you know, then I have to know, do I have the tooling and equipment required to put that car back? Do I have the right spot welders? Right do training. I have the right yeah. training? Does my technician know what he's doing? Um, and so sometimes, um, sometimes cars have to leave our shop, don't they? We're they not well, sometimes qualified. you have to say, you know, it needs this and I don't have that. And I can't properly repair the vehicle with what I have with the training or equipment. Correct. Therefore, I can't fix the car. You can't go borrow it because nope. it's not, you learn how to do a repair on a customer's car. Yep. So it's not like going down the road no and borrowing somebody else's spot car. welder um, to do that. So in this case, um, so for the purposes of the show, we picked an OE. We just picked a Honda Civic. Yep. Um, pretty common core vehicle that's out there on the road, something that everybody shop, whether no matter what OE affiliation you have, you're probably going to see that. Um, and so right off the bat, if we're going to consider replacing a quarter panel on a Honda Civic, what did Honda tell us when we went to the we went to the website? Well, we want to look at a lot of different things. You know, you got your equipment and et cetera. But in this case, first of all, how they built the car and how you're going to put it back together may not be the same. So right off the bat on this uh, Honda, there's... So wait, Mark, I can't just look at what I took off the car and no. then just try to figure out a way to just copy that? Nope. No. Ah. Even no. iCar has come up uh, <laughs> um, in a few of their articles saying that it's no longer a business decision, take it off, put it on the same way that right. they did. So if I said I put it back on just like the factory did it, that might not be that safe. May not be the, that and may not be the safe That's pretty much impossible, repair. especially with a used <laughs> <side>. <laughs> yeah. well, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, especially like when you're doing <coughs> squeeze type resistant spot welds, the spot welds themselves are smaller than the factory. And therefore, a little less strength, so you add some more in some certain cases, and that allows for the strength that it needs to be safe. So if you look at the Honda uh, Civic right off the bat, they, you take 18 welds out, and in that same section area, you're going to put 20 back in. So now, how we prepare that and take it off the vehicle may starts to make a little bit of a difference. Right. And the part we're going to use makes a difference as well. Right, because now my space is going to be somewhat limited. Yep. Can I can I just spot weld over an old spot weld? Generally, no. Yeah. No, it's usually next to it. Yep. The only time you're going to spot weld on top of a spot weld is if you have three layers. Yep. And they want, you know, an, that area there, you'll have to weld through it. Uh, in some goes in some cases, four layers. Another thing you got to remember is uh, on this particular car, you do have a backing plate that's in there, which is not from the factory, which you have to make yourself as opposed to, let's say, somebody like BMW that does just bonds that area, or Mopar that requires you to make a piece, yep. make it fit in there, and then bond everything together uh, to, to ensure that it's welded properly. So you have companies that will have an open butt joint, you'll have a butt joint with backing that might be welded, you might have a butt joint with backing that might be silicone bronzed. Or, or MIG braced, and then you have a, a, a butt joint with backing that might be fully bonded. Yep. So it's very important to look at what the repair procedures are uh, from the manufacturer to ensure that you are doing the repair properly. Yeah. Okay. And then to go back to your question, th where we started to begin with, was can we just go back in the same spot? Well, it depends on the manufacturer. Because Volvo, on some of their non-structural stuff, they'll say put it in exactly the same spot, but if it's structural, like a frame rail, you put it next to it, like Larry said. So we really got to go back to what does the OEM say? Right. Now, when Volvo says that, though, they're assuming that I'm starting with a brand new panel. Absolutely. So I, right. I don't have a donor panel that nope. already has a weld nugget on it from nope. a prior mm. install. No, no and, and the manufacturers don't really give. I don't think I've ever seen one where they say, well, this is how you put a used yeah, no. right. Right. weld on part on. Right. No, they it's don't. all so, OEM. So knowing the number of welds and locations, so in this particular instance, I've got to go back with 20. I'm going to take out 18 spot welds. Yep. I'm going to go back with 20. Yep. But because well, I can't... You do got to read. I mean, that 20 there, once again, I'm trying to show this because I already read it, but that 20 could mean 20 mag, uh, mag plug welds or 20 resistance welds. You got to yep. sometimes look. Some companies require to add 20 to 30 percent more welds than original if the flange allows it. So in this case, it might have been 18 from the factory. It might be 20 mag plug welds, but it these might be 24. Welds, right? These are spot welds. Yeah, these, these are spot, spot welds, welds or 26 right. spot welds. But because we don't have the legend on here, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to confuse the next anybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, also the, the reading material on there, also yeah. to let people know that you yeah. got to read and see what that number represents. Yeah. yeah so and, I, and oftentimes when we when we deal with shops on this, that we say, do you have the instructions for this? And this is all they pull up. It's just. A picture. This is how it's built. This is how we're going to put it back on. Right. But there's a lot more to it that you have to research than just this. Right. Because you've got to know. So now I'm, I've got to be thinking as an estimator about how many that are going to have to go back in. What are those spacing issues? How do I accomplish getting those 20 in yep. with the 
with the right spacing that we have, and that's kind of what we have in here next, right? Yep is what all of these different welds and subcomponents and everything mean. Well, and, and this is really, you know, this slide here is really, what's underneath there? Is it high strength, ultra high strength, 1500? Can we weld to it? Can we not weld to it? When we put it back together, what is our, the, our weld hole size? What is our spacing? And all this becomes really important in replacing the part. Right, it's not up to the technician to decide. No. Because if I try to maybe mag onto 1500 MPA, I'm gonna have a problem, right? You're gonna have a problem. Right. It's going to look good. The panel's going to go on. Yeah. It's going to feel like I don't have a problem, but the next accident. But it's all about the next accident. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to put it in a museum, whatever. If you're going to drive it on the road, different conversation. What's mag welding on 1500 do? It, well, it, it can crystallize the material and change the uh, ch change the tensile strength. You actually raise it, make it more brittle. So you might take 1500 and raise it to maybe 2000 or 2500, right. and now it becomes more brittle. Even though it's stronger, it becomes more brittle. And, I mean, this is the case where um, Honda requires you to do MIG brazing. And this is, goes back to our show we did last year about uh, uh, silicone bronze and MIG brazing, where you drill these two holes close to each other, not a figure eight, but close to each other, and then you zigzag across this hole versus welding on one side of it. So it's a, a modified slot type of thing, or you know, you got two millimeter distance in between the two welds there, and you're gonna zigzag back and forth across it with this uh, MIG brazing uh, that you're gonna have to do for them, as opposed to somebody like Volvo, which does allow uh, MIG welding on their, uh, um, on their 1500 or higher, you know, use of bor boron alloyed steel material. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and all these procedures, you know, it, they do a procedure and then they send it to engineering. Engineers then look at it and say, this is, ex yeah, this is good or this is not good. And then, of course, they don't publish the stuff that's not good. They publish the stuff that they have engineered that works. Yeah. Why does it, I mean, at every OEM, when they allow mag plug welding, has a mm -hmm. diameter limitation. Why? Well, yeah, you have an issue. One is the flange range. Yeah. I mean, I've seen some procedures that actually call for a, a, a you know, an eight millimeter plug weld hole to be drilled. Um, uh, 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 but I've also seen where they've actually required a 10, yep. but it's a much wider flange or it's a mm -hmm. thicker part. Mm -hmm. It depends on what the manufacturer says. Generally, the outer panels are usually going to be an 8 millimeter hole that you're going to punch or you're going to drill. Um, the bigger issue is, is that how much of the weld goes past that area. So if I got an 8 millimeter plug weld hole, uh, I'm going to have a 10 millimeter to 12 millimeter circle by the time I'm done. That's yep. a much bigger area. Mm -hmm. You can affect uh, um, through radiant heat and uh, heating the area, you can affect the inner panels, as Mark said before, such as the 1500 megapascal yeah. or, or even higher grade uh, material. So they actually change the parameters of the reinforcement. So the outer panel looks good, it's attached, but maybe the reinforcement on the inside has now been affected yeah. and could cause a crack. I know Audi tells us when we cut the outer panel on, um, let's say, like the uh, rocker panel area, if we scar the rocker panel in any way, shape, or form, it's like scarring a piece of glass. So now it's no good, it's going to fracture in that area. Now you've got to change that whole thing and we have to be very careful by putting um, sacrificial metal back there before we cut through it. Right. And it's very, very tight tolerance in there between so the outer panel and the inner. Yeah, it's a safety issue, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just like, <laughs> yeah, I want to make my wheel bigger. Nope. Go no. bigger, go home, right? Well, and that's, you know, and, we, and you hear it from technicians often, they go, oh, when this thing gets hit, it, it'll never break. <laughs> my wheel's going to hold. Yep. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Your wealth yeah. not what we're worried about. And it's, it's not about <laughs> over-engineering it or under-engineering. It's putting back exactly the way. And at the end of the day, we want it to be safe. And if something goes wrong, everybody that investigates this is going to go right back to exactly how they said to do it. Right. So we know on this particular car that, we, that we've selected that Honda has some limitations on what type of welding I can do when I'm going through multiple layers of panels mm -hmm. or I'm attaching to a high strength panel. That can be 1500 in the newer Hondas. Um, the D-ring is 1500. Yep. In some older models, even if that D-ring's you know, in the 900 range or whatever, it's going to yep. change the welding that we can do to it. And then we know that the OE has a requirement on when I can mag plug weld, yep. I have a specific diameter that I have to reach. Yep. Okay. We're walking along on our yeah. procedures here, right? And this is how the OEMs are. I mean, they, they're going to be pretty spell it out exactly how it is. And, and not one size fits all. You know, Honda will say one thing, Toyota will say something different, Mercedes will say something different. So we really have to go back to you. What's How the OE say? say? Yeah, and yep. I may have changes within the same OE, like we learned from Mazda mm -hmm. uh, last month in the Mazda OE show that it one mo one manufacturer, but between the different models, they had different procedures for yeah. roof panels, quarter panels. You know, yep. you can't just take it one method and assume. Um, also, have to be thinking about how the panel comes off, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. so yeah. So, so in this case right here, so 
how you take the part off the car determines, in a lot of cases, what kind of part you can actually use. So in this case, if you look on the, uh, the picture of the car, they you know, drilled it from the outside, take the panel off, we'll be able to put another panel back on and go with it. The problem is, if we were going to use a used part in this particular case, we wouldn't be able to. And the biggest reason why, and I'll just show it on the, on the car here, yep. is right up on the top in this area here where you got these three welds, there's no way to get, really get a drill up in here to drill from the backside so that the panel that we've taken off actually has a, uh, a panel that we can actually weld to. We're going to have a hole on the outside. And if we look at uh, the legend, which we're, which we're coming to, that's mm -hmm. a squeeze type resistant spot weld. Mm -hmm. Well, if the panel that we <laughs> took off is a, uh, has a hole, we can't squeeze type. So oh. in this case, it's got to be an OE part and it's because of how we had to take the car apart. Right, now we've got some other things. So here we found out for this particular vehicle, I'm gonna have several spot welds that go through two, three, and four layers of material. Yes. Right, yep. Um, so I've gotta get that bonding through there that we do have basically uh, mag slug welding and it looks like, because there are a couple slots, some mag slots. Well, that, that, that's a, that's a, that whole <laughs> diagram there is a standard Honda diagram. Mm -hmm. So in this particular quarter panel replacement, there is no slot weld. Okay. But that's just their standard diagram where you've got uh, one and two and three and mag plug welds. So that you know, you're, you better make sure that you've got the right spot welder, that it's going to yep. go through those four layers. Right. So you need exactly. to meet Honda's minimum requirements. For well, this is the important thing too, of reading the, yep. the, the, the legend. Uh, and they all have their button test, they call it, or their, their weld testing and stuff. Honda uses a wedge type process to do it. Other companies require a peel test. Um, but we go back to our uh, last year when we did our, um, our Chevy Cruze show, and that has rivets down on the rocker panel area in the back where the rear body panel meets up with the quarter panel. There's slot welds that are MIG brazed, and then you have um, resistance welds the rest of the area. So if you were going to do this repair, and the over the wheel arch uh, opening area was bonded, so if you were doing this repair, you couldn't really, you know, use a, a, a used panel in that particular car because of the way the slot welds are. You're going to be cutting out a lot of the slot to get the slot welds out from the factory, and you'll be duplicating those. So you need a new panel. Um, and, and in the case of around the wheel arch area, it can be very difficult on a lot of the models to actually peel it off. Some use bonding adhesive, some use to use a dampening type material, mm -hmm. which might be a little bit easier to get right. off, but the folding of the flange area does become an issue in that yeah. case. And a lot of companies have gone with that so they can put oversized wider tires on the car. Yeah, yeah. and we're going we're gonna to get into that with iCar's position statement. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I like here that kind of pops up is for that 1500, um, there are some extremely special welding requirements that Honda's yeah. even called out. And so if I'm the estimator making the decision, that's when we go back to equipment and everything. Do I even have what yeah. it takes to do this? Well, do I have the equipment? And then on top of that, do I have the knowledge? And, and then it's, and again, if you notice by Honda here, it's not a blanket statement. Mm -hmm. On 1500, in some specific cases with the asterisk on where we tell you you can, you can do it, but otherwise it's a no. Yep. Right. All right. Now let's talk about, so Larry alluded it to a little bit. We've got a little diagram down there that kind of starts to talk about um, hem flanges. Um, yeah. And, we had a position statement. No, I want to say a position statement because I don't want to use that term. But ICAR no. put out a bulletin on this last year that kind of yep. stirred the water a little bit. Um, and, and they did, you know, what, what they have, where they have a, a panel that comes in and it's insurance companies, it's OEs, it's repairers. Um, it's really every facet of the industry that sits down yep. talks it through and says, hey, we, yep. we think this is the best practice. Um, so let's talk about hem flange quarter panels. Um, does that, if, if I know right away that that car is a hem flange. Does that really make a decision for me off the bat? Yeah, well, it, it, in, many, in most cases, we'll game over it. Because the way that you remove a hem flange panel is you cut off, you just grind the, hem, the flange, and then the panel comes off, and then you go after the backside. Um, so the problem is you can't really roll it back out to try and get to the welds and then tip it back because of how it was compressed, you know, like a paper clip. Eventually it'll break and mm -hmm. it can crack and so it's work hardened too. It's, it's, it's just work hardened, yeah. yeah. So so if you see a hem flange on the panel, it's gonna be a replacement of the panel. Yeah. Just like and we don't use your so this door, is door skins. Yeah, you don't not use, not use door skins. And yeah. the door skin, at least you can flip the door upside down, you got access to all the flange. Here you're working in a very tight area yeah. trying to peel this back. And um, you, you will cause a lot of work hardening to be done in there. You might get it off clean. You might even heat it up and get the panel off. When yeah. you go to put it back on, you might hammer and dolly to get that flange to yeah. roll over again, and it might start cracking on you. 
Now what are you going to do? Weld yeah. up that edge? Well, then you, well, <laughs> you, you got to crack test it and all that. And, you know, it's, Body it's, pillow. Yeah, and for that reason, that's why ICAR, yeah. you know, came out with it. They put it in the repairability technical support on their website, just saying, you know, if this is the type of quarter panel that you have, it's going to be a replacement. Yeah, we had one post up on one of the forums, I think last week or whatever, and the filler was from top to bottom. I mean, there wasn't a piece of paint <laughs> showing. That's the one on you wanted. To sh that's the one you wanted to show in the <laughs> show. Yeah. Like, well, I guess we'll just, you know, build, well, it's like it, that build a quarter. I mean, there's guys out there that would weld nine thousand pins on that, and you know, uh, 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 do body work top to bottom. Uh, you know, now you're becoming a sculptor, mm -hmm. uh, in a way. You know, what's the longevity of that repair? What's the guarantee on the repair? Um, what happens with delamination of the material? Uh, especially if you're in colder, warmer climates where it constantly expands and contracts mm -hmm. between the seasons, you're going to have an issue three, four years down the road with that. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of technicians that think because when they finish it, just like welding onto high strength steel or whatever, when I finish it, it looks good. The panel's on there. Yep. I feel like I've made a good repair. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm super skilled. I can take that panel off and not damage that hem flange, but you really have. Yeah. And to, then to say I don't have comebacks, well, we've we prove that every day with fast food, right? Yeah. We go through fast food lines, we order, you know, and they're wrong, but we don't turn around and make them fix the order. We just, because we're halfway down the I'm road, down the road yeah. it, right? Or people trade the car in. There's so much that's going on that you don't know about that yep. to, to say, I don't have come back so I'm a good tech, yeah. um, really, or I'm a good shop, really yep. doesn't speak to anything. Yeah. That's and, like you know, and back to the quarter panel not being structural, it really doesn't matter what the manufacturer says. Just think about it. If we take this, this quarter panel that we've taken off here, Okay, if it's not structural, fine. Let's just put it back on the road that way and put a crash on it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there, even though they don't consider it structural, it's got structural tendencies. That well, it's a secondary, tertiary structural yeah. component. I mean, all the P pages list the same thing that these these components may not be classified as structural, but they're secondary structural assist yeah. in holding the structural components together. I mean, look, a trunk floor is not considered most of the time structural, but if you didn't have a trunk floor in there, well, what happened to the whole back end of most of these cars? You know, you just got the yeah. frame rails holding on to the rear body panels, the quarter panels are not attached to the, to, to the, to the uh, uh, rear floor rails, the whole back of the car is going to yeah, twist. You kind of need the floor to hold yeah, it Yeah, you need together. the floor <laughs> to hold it together. It's a, it's a tertiary uh, structural component. It yeah. assists in this overall structure or torsional strength of the yeah. car, not it's strength for a collision. Yeah. That's so the big difference well, there. It, then it's just overall repair quality. So yeah. I'm not fixing cars to make it to the next trade-in. Right. I'm fixing cars to last for the lifetime of Absolutely. that owner having them. So if, if you know you're weakening a panel, you know it's potentially going to fail over over time, then it's not a, it's not a, it's not repair. a repair. We don't do no. it, period. Exactly. We walk away. Doesn't exactly. matter how old the vehicle is. Doesn't matter if it's the daily driver. Doesn't matter if it's the grandma's car and she's on a fixed income. We don't do it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, we just don't do it. So um, we got a can uh, question coming in that says, <laughs> hey, Larry, uh, let's, uh, you don't even have to finish this one. I know yeah. what it's going to be. I yeah. know what it's going to um, be, too. What would be yeah. the best practice to replace a quarter panel on really any Hyundai? Larry or Kia. Got, or, well, we have some well, information. Well, Hyundai and Kia will provide certain information for certain vehicles. Dan, I'm telling you this much. If they don't have a procedure for it, total the car out. Total the car out. I don't care if it's brand spanking new and someone put a bullet hole in the quarter panel. Okay, there's no procedure for it. You're taking all that liability for figuring out, oh, well, I'm going to use ICAR practice. I'm going to use just my best opinion. Guess what? Your best opinion is going to be a problem when you get to court. If Hyundai and Kia will not release repair information in the United States that they do have basically for everything in Canada and Europe because they're afraid of our liability laws, then you know what? We're going to have your cars totaled out and we're just going to tell them, don't buy Hyundais, don't buy Kias because they don't provide repair information. I'm not taking the risk. Yeah. You want take it to your own backyard yep. and fix it on your own property with used aftermarket. I don't care what you do, but you can do whatever you want on your own car. I'm not getting involved in it because not, it's not worth my liability. As we've seen, shops are starting to be held accountable for it. And there was one big, huge case last year that proved that you can be held accountable for making up your own repair yep. procedures. Yep. And, yep. And, and unfortunately, those two poor people suffered <coughs> a, a, a lot of injury. And one guy really, I mean... That guy's life's going to yeah. be miserable. Now, how much? You can give him seven hundred million dollars. Well, well, yeah, but what about industry standards then? There is no industry oh. standard. There is no <laughs> industry standard. The industry standard set by the manufacturer for each and every vehicle, each and every model. 
yeah. that they have in their line. You know, so, so there's only a standard on a 2015 Honda Civic, and the standard for that car is Honda's Honda, Honda Civic. Yeah. But it yeah. might be completely different from a 2015 Honda Accord yep. or an MDX. Yep. Here's, here's the thing to think about, and, and I haven't talked <coughs> about this a lot publicly, but that industry standard thing that you hear a lot of insurance companies flying around, we only owe to industry standard, that really came out of the homeowners division. So there's yes. a lot of case law back there that says, hey, it only takes so well, much so to put a stud market value. Up. So does market value and competitive pricing all comes out of real estate. Right. But but you know, think about it. In the homeowners industry, we basically would go in and say, look, it only it, you put a stud wall up with two by fours this way. Yep. And I because I it's put, all the same wood. It's pressure treated wood or whatever the case right. is. Just like sheetrock. Right. And the bottom, so yeah. saying yeah. Right. that there's an industry standard for framing or roofing or whatever, and there's a lot of case law that came out of this, out of the, um, and then trying to take that theory and apply it over an automotive that says we only owe the industry standard. That's just kind of hogwash. Doesn't if work. no shop, if, if there are 20 shops in a market and 19 of them don't have the proper equipment and aren't fixing cars right, then and one does, then we're going to pay the one and those other 19 shops shouldn't be getting any work. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. that's, as an insurer, that's what I should be looking at. If you're not properly equipped, you don't get the work. Yeah. So we don't pay to the lowest common denominator and ask everybody to lower their standards for repair and call it an industry standard. Right. We're going to go to the top of what it takes to fix the car safely and that needs that to be our, that's our OE and the OE is the industry standard period. Yeah. It's really not up for debate. We actually have a standard. Yeah, it's the OE. It's the OE, the OE you know, is our I've, standard. I've done home improvement stuff. I've worked with friends because I wanted to learn and I've offered my services for free, you know, to try and do stuff. And you, I learned you how to come to Oregon. No, I don't want to come to Oregon. <laughs> I got enough doing that. I got a list around here. <laughs> I, I did enough of the demo and stuff, but I've helped lay out tile. I want to learn how to do tile. I thought mm -hmm. it was interesting. I learned how to cut tile. There's a standard for cutting tile. There's a standard for cutting pipe. There's one mm -hmm. tool. There might be five or six different companies that sell it, but it's one tool. Yep. You're cutting one type of metal pipe. Right. Doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. You can pick different sizes of it, but basically it's a, so you can make a standard on that. You can't make a standard on collision repair, even from the same manufacturer, okay? It's just complete. Battery disconnects on cars are completely different across multiple lines of vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you, coming up with an industry standard is a lie, yeah. and it just shows your ignorance for this collision repair industry if you actually say that to somebody. Yeah, it's a nice attempt, and, mm -hmm. it, and for insurers... It's a nice it, lie. It's a nice it, attempt and lie. Yeah, I think sometimes it, it just don't, it's just a, a lack of education and understanding, and then it goes to a department of insurance and to an insurance commissioner. That sounds reasonable because they're used to hearing it on the homeowner's side, and it's, it's just an education thing. Because you don't have an answer to a question, yeah. so you just come up with some yeah. lie or BS. Just like when people say, oh, it's in the policy. Okay, here's the policy you show me, because I, I don't find myself to be that stupid, and I think I'm pretty well, pretty well read, read with stuff, and I read through the policy. I don't see it in there, so you please show yeah. me where it says it in the policy, and 99.9% .9 of the time we're like, um, oh, so you were lying to me. You never read the policy. You just told that. You're repeating it like a parrot. You know, and we're really talking about an attempt to simplify, because, yeah. you know, we, we see on those on the groups a lot, people are like, we just need like a, like a, a chart that tells us everything we need to know about every car to fix. Yeah. And, we, and that chart can't be built. No. Right, exactly. All right, so let's get back to our quarter panel here. Yep. Yep. Um, I got on my soapbox <laughs> on industry standard. Apologize. Um, but so just a real summary of what the challenges we would have found with this 2015 Accord. So yep. basically, after reviewing my OE information and knowing that no matter what type of pay, uh, product or part I'm going to install, I Doesn't must matter. follow the OE. Yep. Um, I've got three different types of steel to get through. Yep. And that I've got some backside issues, so yep. I, I really wouldn't be able to remove the panel and still meet my squeeze type resistance yep. spot welding requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so hole size, right? We have a hole diameter, and there's no way I'm going to drill out a spot yeah, weld. Well, if we drill say, out a 10 millimeter, we drill, put a drill bit on to drill out the welds on this car. If with a drill bit, the hole we drill is going to be 10 millimeters. So I'm already on most of them. Yeah, and then I'm going to grind millimeters. it and make it a little bit bigger because I'm going to deburr it. Yep. So now I'm maybe 10 and a half millimeters. And to put the part on the car, to even mag weld it, they want an eight millimeter. So even in the areas they say to mag weld, I can't do it on this car. Right. You right? know, the other issue that guys have to look at with that, with that whole thing that you just explained there, you're adding heat by one, drilling the panel off. Talking about the, the used panel. You're adding heat by drilling the, the, drilling the panel off. You're adding heat again at each one of those holes that you're gonna debar, okay? Then you're gonna sand the inside and outside mm -hmm. smoother so that you can do your welding and yeah, stuff, and there's, the not, there's right. no 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 uh, uh, thick areas, and you are going to thin out a little bit of the metal unless you're using a roll lock rubberized disc. Then you're going to weld on the panel. That adds more heat to that panel. So you already have three or four other heat applications or tempering of a used panel before you ever get to 
what you would start with with, with a new panel. Mm -hmm. And then you compound it by the welding, by now the dressing of the welds, the cleaning of the area to be able to repaint it. Mm -hmm. So you, you have one that has four or five heat applications, the other one has like nine or 10 heat applications. Yep. So you can change the, the metallurgical properties of this particular material. Right, and then yeah. I have a hem flange. Yeah, we had a head flange, so that game over's it. Yeah, that's like three strikes, we're out, right? Yeah. And then if that wasn't enough, then, the labor yeah, would be. And, <laughs> and let me just explain one something about the labor. So if we got the panel that's on the car, if we're gonna use the outer panel again, if we drill from the outside, we can't squeeze tight. Right. right. So I gotta drill it from the backside. And if I'm drilling from the backside, I gotta get up in here and drill all these from the backside all the way through. And I can tell you it's gonna take me longer to drill from the backside. So I'm going through multiple layers in some cases. And a lot of times you gotta cut, you gotta is, cut areas open. And this is 1500 here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then on top of that, then I've got, you know, I've got to get in here and, and get it all very clean and not drill through it. And I, it's, it's a lot more surgical. It's going to take right. me longer. Right. The removal process. You've got to be very, very careful. Yeah. And, and you've got, so you got the take process me of, it's gonna cost more money. like you said, to do everything from the backside, I'm going to have to cut pieces off my, my, my used section there, my used quarter right. section, yep. quarter of the car there. Uh, I'm gonna have to cut pieces out and cut maybe access holes in the rear package tray or something so I can get in there with my drill so I can drill it out. And you know, more than likely, you're gonna have to put some sort of stopper on the drill so you don't drill all the way through it. Then you're gonna That's have to carefully yep. take it because you don't want to thin out the outer panel. You're gonna have to drill a lot of the way through the other panels and then take a, a hammer and a chisel lightly and tap it but not break the outside right. piece. And you know you're gonna make a few mistakes no matter how careful or how good you are. And it could take you almost a day, uh, a full work day. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, if not a little bit longer to get that Especially panel. Especially when you're taking oh. a drill bit and you're trying to punch through 1500 with yes. the boron bit. And then the next panel on, on the outside of that that you're gonna try and not drill through. Is a mild is steel a mild panel. Steel. And you're gonna go right <laughs> through like it's butter. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh -huh. So right now we know without having to go any further or do anything just based on knowing Not even what, the dollars, but everything right, else. Without yeah. any dollars, without yeah. any of that, we know that this is a no-go. We yeah. would not be able to put a used quarter on this vehicle. Wouldn't matter if somebody wanted to give me that quarter for <coughs> free. Yep. If I had zero cost in the quarter panel, it still would be a no. Because we can't fix it the way the OEM we, said. We can't go back the way the OE says yep. to go back. Can't put it back on. So now we're off. But let's pretend, guys, mm -hmm. because that's that's different than pushing. If I walk through all those steps and I explain it to an insurance company or explain it to my customer who's really all that matters as long as my customer understands and approves what's being done to the car if I explain all that I don't have to push a position statement blindly across the desk and say because Honda says no <laughs> right but that's why they say no right well when my kid right. comes up and, and and goes but why but why but why right mm -hmm. and we and you get my used to get mad at your parents when they would go because that's it yeah that's the same thing on a position <laughs> statement well that's where I think some of these <laughs> position okay. statements they need to look at this and go okay we made a position statement about you know use salvage parts or whatever they want to call them or aftermarket parts okay we need some examples in that same thing a second page to your position statement why here's why right here's why right. Yeah. here's some issues but yeah you know lower rails okay uh, deal uh, or, or ride supports deal with the collision pulse for airbag timing and stuff like that rear rails deal, deal with airbag time or well uh, the the restraints protection built within seats okay we got that rocker panels you can you know you can but the outer panels that are welded on we need that information for these guys yeah, yeah I mean I, I guess from from a position of if I'm gonna call myself a repair professional I shouldn't have to have the OE explain that to me right. because this was very easy to go yeah, through and, and devise the science of why that was a wrong decision. But we decision. had to do one important thing nobody wants to do. We had to read. But, and that goes for whether if I'm an insurance and I, and I put yep. that insurance hat on and I wear it because that was a majority of my career. Mm -hmm. I, I never went into a shop and said, but I want you to put this panel on regardless of the why, right? Mm -hmm. It was always, a, let's have a discussion around the science. Right. If you're going to call yourself an adjuster, you're calling yourself an automotive professional, or if you're going to call yourself a claims manager, then you better be able to go through these steps as mm -hmm. well. So if you're going to walk in a shop and tell them they should put a used quarter panel on that car, you better be prepared to tell them the science of why. Because we hope the shop's prepared to turn around and tell you the science of why not. Yeah, and then we have a discussion on the science, not on the because I want that part on the car, I have an APU KPI that yeah. I've got to hit, or my boss wants me to use more parts, or, or any of the stuff that we get caught in a discussion. Just take the dollars and all the other stuff out of it and go, can we do this the right way? Right. Yes or no? And then it settles it. And then it's every car every time, because mm -hmm. just because we fixed a Honda Civic last week, 
they could change it next week. Mm -hmm. or this and afternoon. It, arms your, it arms your customer. So if yeah. that customer does make a decision to pull that car from your shop and go, well, I'm going to go down the road, then at least they're going to go down the road armed with information that hopefully they're yeah. going to ask the next shop, well, why are you going to do it if, that, if this shop says it can't yeah. be done? Well, the way they cut this, why can't I just put it in this way? Oh, I'm just going to slap Just take the roof off. You know, take the roof panel off and just, you know, cut the floor that way. So now I avoid all your your your, your high strength steel areas yeah. and your your advanced high strength. Why can't you just put it on that way? Because I've heard <coughs> shops say that before. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. the problem is, is look, you're cutting the floor panels and rails, and you're going to make up your own overlap, you know, fillet right. weld type procedures, your own welding procedures, your own sectioning procedure. It it's one of the craziest ideas I've ever heard. But why don't you put the whole thing in one piece? You need an hour in, uh, in or out of wheelhouse. Yeah, you might be able to cut it off easy. Yeah. You might, because it's on a, a, a on a stand, drill out everything, but you can't weld it back on that yeah. way. It can't doesn't work. On. Just <laughs> give me a couple of hours for some sleeves and some Gorilla <laughs> Glue, and that quarter's going right back on. You're never going to know. Why can't we but just <laughs> use sheet metal screws? We so much <laughs> Velcro. Velcro will work out great, because in case it gets hit again, just pull it, off it comes off real yeah. easy. Well, I went yeah. in the late 80s, early 90s. That was almost what panel bomb was <laughs> in some respect. Yeah. I could walk up and just take a panel off the car yeah. uh, for whatever. So let's pretend, though, guys, that... For some odd reason, in my long history of a career, I have never found a car that I could go through the OEs and go, eh, used might work. So if someone has one out there, we would love to see it. I'm welcome, welcome to be proved wrong well, on this one. Especially if you're dealing like a 1976 car. Okay, you're right. That might, yeah. yeah. But okay. not in today's cars. Yeah. And, so you're not, and if a car's been hit in a 1976 yeah. car, it's probably a toll. Yeah. Yeah, m more than likely. I mean, look, you know, the, 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 the changes in vehicles... And this is all brought upon by insurance companies because they'll pay thousands upon thousands of dollars for, for vehicle repairs and millions on bodily injury. So all these airbags, all these safety features, all these uh, ADAS systems, all these sensors are not because it's convenient, fun stuff for cars to have. We're starting to get used to it, but the, the insurance companies based on the, on the bodily injury department needed vehicles to be safer and protect people because of the millions upon millions of dollars they're paying out. Where the consumer deserves to be safe. And, the, and, yeah. the, and on top of that, the consumer deserves to be safe and drive a safe vehicle. So, you know, you have all these factors coming into this, and this is why we have these issues nowadays, and, and, and you know, you're trying to save money on the back end because of vehicle safety issues. Yeah. All right, guys, so let's pretend for a second that we did not find anything in the OE procedures that would have prevented us from using a used panel. Yep. So on my estimate now, I, as an estimator, I may be considering adding, don't, don't react, Larry. I may be considering <laughs> putting that used part on my estimate right now. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, as the estimator, I've done my due diligence on the front end, there's nothing that I checked the box, no, that ruled that part out. No, now I'm on to considering. Yeah. So now I'm considering a used part. What do I need to think about well, now? Take Hyundai. Hyundai <laughs> Kia. They don't say anything about not using it. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? I'll tell you, you can use it. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. You can do whatever you want in life. But remember, it's your liability. Right. And it's yeah. the lives of somebody in that car. Right. So let's walk through it, yeah, though. Let's walk through it. I mean, let's, you know, let's say, you know, so first of all, how, we, how we're going to take the car apart is different than we're going to put it back together. Right. So we got to get access to all the backsides of those welds. Um, you know, may, t may require re r and some other additional parts inside, et cetera. Um, and it's going to take longer because we're going to have to surgically remove the part. Right. And not destroy it in the process. You know, if it's coming off the car, just rip out the whole inside of it. You know, that way we're just pulling little flanges off. Right. It's, it's Which is, I think this picture is, is basically, we know we need a quarter on this car. Yeah. And this is how I've gone through the removal process, yeah. right? And that quarter's coming off super duper fast. Yep. I may have that quarter off, and what do you what do you think, Larry? If I'm gonna take the quarter off, what hour? Maybe have it off in an hour or so. What's that? The outer Rem panel. Remove the quarter. Well, Pro I mean, once you get used to doing them and stuff like that, you you know, each technician will be a little bit different in time. But this is the obviously this technician. I don't know anything about this picture whatsoever. It's one of the ones we grabbed, but this would make it easier to remove a lot of the flanges. Right. Mm -hmm. To kind of roll it back against itself as you roll around, even with the heat, and you can get access to the backside and heat it up either, either with the heat gun. They really don't recommend open flame, although I see a lot of techs try that. Mm -hmm. But golf forbid you wanted to use an open flame, which I don't recommend. At least if it flares up, you know where it's at. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can see it right away, yeah. and you're not going to cause a smoldering fire layer later on. Um, and this gives you plenty of access to see what's behind this. So obviously, that tech's probably done this particular car a bunch of times, knows where to cut the right. outside sure. portion. Yeah, absolutely. But if I was shipped my donor chunk, 
which is what mm -hmm. we have kind of braced up on the rack behind sure. us. Yep. Love my little Evo kit supporting. That was kind of awesome. <laughs> um, but if I was shipped to my donor chunk, yep. and I look at the the, bot, the estimating manuals for basically R and R, so let's think about the remove process mm -hmm. or whatever. That's not what I'm going to get to do to this donor no. chunk. It's no, not. well, I mean, you guys it's think not. about it. You got two R and Is this is one of the bigger problems that shops don't realize? It's not cost effective. Forget about how much time it actually takes. And that two hour cleanup is a bunch of crap, also. But uh, uh, to prep it and get it ready and stuff. Uh, uh, but to take it off, uh, it's more time to take a panel off than it is to weld it back on, especially with resistance welds. Um, so let's say you have 13 hours for a quarter panel. It might be three hours time-wise allocated for welding the panel on and 10 hours for taking it off. You know, right. so once you figure out how much time it is actually to take it off, you could have 20 hours in just removal of two panels mm -hmm. before you ever get to just welding that panel yeah, on. We're going to show a few videos. Right. Of you know, and this this becomes so an let's, issue. Let's think about now that I'm, I'm, I'm not removing the panel per se from my donor part. I'm going to remove it from my car, my real car that belongs to my customer, right? Yep. Now I'm surgically trying to salvage a piece of metal off of a chunk of scrap in a way. Yep. So let's go through all the different processes that's going to take. First of all, weld removal tools. I'm well, going to use a variety, well, I mean, right? Well, well, let's just look at it. If we got a mild steel outer quarter panel and we're just going to, you know, zip off all the welds from the outside, good access and all that, I can use pretty much a regular drill, a regular drill bit to do that. Or you can use a, a, a like the Dynabraid tool. Or I, tool or I can the use the Dynabraid and, and yep. cut them off either way. Yep. I can't do that on a if I'm trying to save the panel. So now I'm going to go from the back side. In the back side, I'm going to be drilling through in some cases 1500 or 980 or something like that. I need a triple fluted tungsten carbide bit to go through that. Yep. So I need a whole potential different tool set. And you really kind of rule out your 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 uh, Dynabraid type of tool, the belt sander, because one, you don't have access to, yep. you might be heating too much of the back side yep. and then heating the outside panel too much. So that, you know, that's great for an outer panel, take off on a brand new and putting a new panel on. On a used panel, you're going to have an issue with trying to get to that yeah. back side. Yeah. Yeah, so how do we get the welds out from a OE standpoint, just taking it off my customer's car versus how I'm going to take it off? It's a different process. Completely different. Lots of extra labor. And lots of extra labor. Extra and labor material. And Drill bits aren't cheap. And, no. no. And that chisel's probably not the brightest way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of, uh, we had some, uh, in fact, these are from Honda. So yep. thank you, Scott, from Honda for um, Bruce, allowing yeah. us yes. to have some of your pictures here. Yep. But so that's me attempting, or him attempting to drill out some spot welds, right? He actually, then, he's not an attempt. He did. He did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now he did a good job. Nothing did, this for the, did this for the symposium. That's just what he had, had right? Uh, last month. Yeah. But then... Because I'm not just cutting that hem flange like it tells me to do in the installation procedures and then and then chunking all that material off, yep. now I'm heating and I'm trying to release the adhesive that's on that wheel opening yep. and I'm trying to pull all that back and now I'm finessing that, right? Yep. Well, and it's, and it's difficult to heat up something that's glue and then get it all heated up enough to get it to completely pull off because if you let it cool down too much, it glues itself back together in some cases. Right. So you got to really um, go through it, and you got to get the welds out, and you got to move pretty quickly, which means you have to increase the heat, and that heat could damage the outer panel that you're going to put on the next car. Right. And that's on the rolled hem plant. And I got to try to save a body line because most all yeah, of these have a little body line over the top of the wheel well. Yeah. That's like the worst place you could put a body line. Thank you, Oes. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> gets lots of creases and dings and dents. But but I'm trying to save that right because yeah. I can't really come back later and recreate the body line with a gallon of filler. Right. That's not fair to the customer either, yeah. right? Line so in a can. I'm yeah. gonna spend uh, <laughs> I'm gonna spend a lot of time I love with the pencil, the people that draw the pencil. I'm gonna put the body line back here. Yep. Really? Um, so I'm gonna spend a lot of time doing that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then So there it is. That's what he did. And that took probably a day. I, I didn't ask I should have yeah. asked him how long. Yeah. Um, but we did one here and that took him uh, you know. Pretty much uh, almost a full day, yep. uh, almost no breaks, and, and, and it's still not ready to weld on the car. It's no. off. Yeah. Still it's more. cleanly off, but there's a lot more to be well, done. Well, even if you look at the picture there, I mean, it, that's, this is Scott's typing from Honda. Right. He said basically a quarter still needs cleanup to install, did incur some damage where the adhesive didn't release. You know, there's, there's residual things we're going to have to do, and there's also, you know, if you actually look in this case um, on this quarter panel here, we've got... Right here, we've got like glue that's still in there. So we, we got to grind all that stuff off before we put it back on the car so we can go. I mean, so it's not like just having a part and there's a lot more steps. Yeah, I'm not unboxing, unboxing a new OE E-Coat panel that I get to start with right no. now. So no, um, not like that one. Yeah, so 
you, guys, you made a quick list of some of the additional labor considerations that if you were, again, we, we, we voted no, right? Because we went through our procedures and we said no used panel on this car based on the science of it. But if we were in fairyland and we were going to install this part, um, here are some of the additional labor considerations that Danny and the DEG sent us that said, yep. hey, it doesn't matter what estimating system you are using, these are non-included operations and we need to be additional labor times. Yep. Um, Let's go through some of those. Well, so additional labor, obviously, if a part's setting in, in, into a you know a, a yard for years and years or whatever, mm -hmm. this, there's cleanup, and I'm talking pressure washer cleanup. Yep. Yeah. There's moss. There's needles. There's you know we just got to get the dirt and grime Rats, and all nests, that. Rats, everything yeah, else. All that stuff. In. It's got to yeah. come off. Yeah. And then when they take the part out of the car, they don't normally re you know remove the glass in a lot of cases. We got a whole bead of glass that's broken out, etc. You know, quarter glass or back glass. So now we got to clean all that glass up. It's sitting in there. Um, and then what about the previous condition of that part? Does it right. have multiple paint layers in it? Are we at 13 mils? Got to strip it down, scratches, all that stuff. Yeah, because there's nothing that says when that car, when that part comes to you that it wasn't on a car that had been previously fixed. Um, I've, I've had a lot of times I've walked into shops that have called and, and shown me pictures where that used chunk was now full of filler. <laughs> because somebody had straightened that. Yeah, quarter yeah someone before. did a, a sculpting uh, job to it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like, really? Do we not check these things? Uh, but yeah, there's wash and clean up, and you definitely want to do that before that part comes would come into your facility, mm -hmm. so you don't drag in literally rat's nest. And some yeah, of the rats. better recycling yards actually do wash them. That's true. And before if it's they been, all of them, but some yeah. of them. And if it's been painted a few times, just I don't know, blend the quarters for um, you know bumper replacement or the door got replaced and they painted the quarter. Um, now you have maybe too much material and then you're going to have to media blast it down. Yep. Right. Uh, so you got to check the film thickness on there. And, and once you get the quarter off, what do you got left over there? Yeah. Yeah. You uh, I mean, you got this big, huge piece here. Yeah. Well, well we got that down there. Right? Yeah. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> so, uh, so we additional. Have a joke on that, by the way. There's a broken glass from yep. the window openings and stuff yep. that will have to be cleaned up. That's not included. Um, labor to. Fix the defective panel, as you mentioned. Uh, in fact, this one shipped in and had dents in it, right? Yep, so we're going to have... Actually, if we picked it up, there's a couple of dents and a couple of scratches. Yeah, so there's a lot of repair. Even if I could get the quarter panel on, once it's on, I'm still going to be doing additional um, right. cleanup. That's not cleanup time, no. and that's not a discount from LKQ no. or, or Pro Performance well, the, or whoever you're ordering your You know, it's your funny. I are. see, like, they come in with their credit card, you know, or hand type of thing, I don't know, this hieroglyphic thing that they come oh, up with. Estimating. And I, I, I've dealt with a couple of the uh, shops who use it. I mean, my clients don't use any of this stuff, but uh, I know some shops that do, and it's like, you know, well, it's $300 for this part. Now, I'm not saying a quarter, but it's $300 right. for a part. We'll knock 50 bucks off. Huh? 50 bucks off. <laughs> it's a five hour repair on the panel. How about you give me the panel for free, and I'll still buy a new one anyway, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not taking it from you. I mean, it, it's comical what happens. Like, they just don't understand. It's like, oh, I'm going to knock 50 bucks yep. off. Where are, you, where are you making your profit on that? The guy's still going to spend three, four hours fixing it. Yeah. You yep. know? Yep. And then and then there's always some parts, as you can see from this chunk, there's always parts and stuff attached that you don't need that's got to come off. And, yep. and so those are all these additional labor considerations that you've got to make. And, and we can beat this to death. It doesn't get covered by two hours of cleanup time no. or four hours of cleanup no. time even. So we're not even talking about cleanup time at this point. And then, like you said. Your favorite. Yeah, I got this huge chunk <laughs> left over, right? And, yep. and we call that Hulk removal. Yeah, so what is that? Well, that's because I pay Larry to haul it off to the dumpster. <laughs> My so, back's out. Um, because he loves parts so much. Yeah. Well, you got to realize, I mean, uh, in the Midwest or the South, I guess uh, a lot of the shops have uh, pretty pretty decent sized pieces of property. And I don't know what they're... Or the scrap metal people that'll come and, I'm, and the yeah. scrap metal people come around, they might pick up a whole whole Chunk. piece whole of that that thing there in new york a lot of times you have to have a dumpster new york city area long island uh sometimes in, in northern eastern new jersey you have to have a dumpster that you cut your metal up and put it in there i mean there's sometimes we even have to cut fenders in half to fit them in there yeah. so now you got this big huge piece here well, the guy's gonna have to spend two hours cutting this thing the up yeah. small small enough We're, even bumpers we got to cut up yeah. We've got to cut bumpers in pieces and throw them in a dumpster and stuff yeah. like that so that they fit. So you have like three or four different type dumpsters that come and get picked up because they're not going to come pick up that whole big piece. Unless you call up the, the, the junkyard and tell them to come back, hey, pick up the rest of the crap. 
I don't need it. We'll call yeah. it core. A core. Yes, no. core. <laughs> core return. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's so get a new business, <laughs> core return. <laughs> Hulk return, or, uh, <laughs> Hulk smash part. Okay, um, so we've got some videos that we, because we went through our little donor part here mm -hmm. that we got, and, and we had our tech here, so Matt here in the, in the office tried to you know, get the part off and go through different things and test different drill bits and do yep. some stuff on it. Yep. Um, so bottom line, additional removal. So if I was gonna use this part, I'm gonna need to think about, I'm removing the panel times two. Well, y you could say it's times two, but it's actually not times, times two, two plus. It's times two plus. Yeah. Because yep. we're going to have to spend more time in, you know, we're not going to be able to do it the same way. So it's at least times two. Mm -hmm. I, I can take that Dynabraid tool and remove the quarter on the, the actual vehicle a lot quicker than I can taking care on trying to remove a used sectional piece here and taking yep. that quarter panel off that used component yeah. to get that one part off that I need. Yeah. Uh, off that assembly, I should say, to get that one component I need. So I have to be that much more careful and probably not be able to use such a, a fast tool like the Dynabraid tool that's a belt send that I can go through a lot of these welds very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you look at all the things he's doing, uh, between um, grinding all that seam sealer rock guard, well, you gotta taking all that it, stuff grind off. It, then you can find your welds yeah. right, to actually get to, and you got to do that in both cars. Yeah. But then how are we going to do it? And, you know, obviously the, the Dynabraid tool will be... Fast. Well, and on the first tool, so I mean, if I'm scraping through seam sealer and doing some stuff to find the welds, mm -hmm. when I'm taking it off my real car, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't have to get it perfect because no. I'm not reinstalling that part. Right. But now on this donor panel, I got to get all of that rock guard off. I got to get all of that seam sealer yep. off because I've got to reinstall that panel and then I've got to paint that panel and prep it for finish and all that. So that's extra labor. Whereas on the removal, I may just do enough to expose my welds. Well, now and then, and then let's not, let's not forget about material too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's extra abrasives, extra, extra. You know, if you have to do more work, it's going to take extra material. Right. Which so, none of that stuff is included no. in anything in the estimate unless you put down, you know, a specific area for shop materials or those type of materials. Yeah. I mean, such as some of the tools we have over there. Yeah. All that stuff gets, you know, pretty much used up pretty, pretty quickly yeah. Yeah. When, you're, when you're working. Yeah, so if I was in the estimating system and I had a potentially five hours to remove the panel, so if part of my R&R &R time was five hours to remove that. Mm -hmm. Well, I still need that five, right? Because I got to get I the panel all off the car. Yeah, all right? Now it's I'm going to go more. surgically remove a panel, so now I need 10. So maybe- I need at least five plus, need, and yeah. it's, maybe it's 10, yeah. I got to double that time down because I'm surgically removing that part. And so that's when it comes to, if we, if, if we were just going to do a financial cost analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know we could probably come up with something crazy and say, well, a Bentley quarter panel is $24,000. But <laughs> <laughs> we're not fixing Bentleys. Well, and this, and this, <laughs> so, is, this is actually really pretty simple math. Yeah. You know, 642.50. Looked yesterday in the da estimating database. That's what it was. That's the OEM part price. Used by uh, part price, including markup, was 343. So it's a 298.75 cent change. Yeah. Savings. Uh, off the top, that looks like hey, that's pretty good. I'm saving almost 300 dollars. Yep. yep. Hey, off the top, it looks pretty good, Larry. Follow so me somebody's along. life is worth 300 bucks? No, but financials. Financial. No. Just oh, life is worth financially. Oh, I see. So if we're looking at financials, it looks like I'm saving $300, right? But mm -hmm. then the kicker is, I got to add all this extra labor now. That's yep. not part of the R and R time. Yep. Um, and so you know, not to go into labor rate, but if we go six times a labor rate, and that six is kind of a minimum. Yeah. In fact, we you know even that's less time than it took to get that panel off on this one. Mm -hmm. But at least we said let's just go, just you know, bottom line. Being very conservative. And then, and then so if somebody says, well, we'll give you two hours for that, what are you actually doing then? You're giving away four to eight You're hours. You're doing 48 hours for free. Yeah. Just, I mean, you can't get around it. You got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And besides, if, like I said, if, if we had checked off all the safety boxes and said, mm -hmm. okay, we'll move forward, then, then I'm giving away a ton of labor. And I, I think estimators sometimes forget how much they're giving away. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes our technicians have some cheats and some things that they do that kind of then also would prevent the panel from being installed. Mm -hmm. um, but if we think about everything we'd have to do to do it right, that's a lot of labor on the tech. Mm -hmm. The tech loses a lot of money every time that someone estimates a used quarter panel on a well, vehicle. So does the shop. It's the tech, it's the shop. It, you know, and economically, does it make really any sense? Yeah. No. And it's a, so our conclusion, right? Yeah. The, the purpose of this show was it's, it's not a, a, a knock on a used part or used part companies or anything that's out there. There are parts that have value and a place yeah, in the industry. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, but there are parts that have value and a place in the industry. Okay, Larry, hang on, hang on. Yeah, holding back. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in this particular situation, in my 20 something year career, I have never been able to find a situation where that, except for a restoration job. I used yeah. to ride some, some resto cars, 60s, 
50s muscle cars, different situation, but yep. I've never been able to find a case where I can yep. even make it scientifically yeah, And work. this is not about a position statement. Mm -hmm. This is just that it's why they have position statements, but this whole conversation is not about, you know, the position statement. Right. It's about the feasibility Let's of the Let's just look every car every time and see is it feasible. The position statement, they may have one, they may not, but the reality is is that can we fix the car the right way? Exactly. Yeah. At the end of the day. If you take some testing into, you know, into into play here and stuff that you're going to try and do and you know look I I if somebody would pay pay us to do it we could do it on multiple cars mm -hmm. it would, i'll be honest with you it's going to get very pricey to have us film with a timestamp on somebody working on the car making sure it's done as as cost effectively as it possibly could be and showing what the panel looks like afterwards it would be a very expensive video to make but the video would probably prove a lot to a lot of different companies. But, you know, maybe in your own shop you can, you know, do some videos yourself yeah. or show what a panel looks like after it's been off. Hey, you, you, know, you know my guy Mark. Mark works, you know, Mark's a very good worker. You've been in here. We're in a DRP uh, relationship, let's say. Here, Mark, take that quarter panel off. And you're, you're there during the day. You write cars on the, sh on the property. Keep looking. Watch. And he sees him. Mark, hey, you know, I know Mark does really nice work. And you can say to yourself, she can call hub boss and say, hey, look, we really can't use these used yeah. quarters on these cars because Mark did it. Well, Mark's great tech. I mean, I watched him do the whole thing. And it came off. It mm -hmm. wasn't that really that usable. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, do your own uh, you know, time study, test yeah. study, whatever the case is, to try and prove the point. Because, you know, it, it becomes at a certain point it's not cost effective. And we try to show this here that it's just not cost effective with this car. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. And even in cars that it might be cost effective, the OEM procedures of, of the, the attachment. Yeah. I mean, if we picked no, the no, Mopar, no. this no. would have been a 30-second class. Yeah, it's two <laughs> slides. It's two slides. It's well bonded on. You can't get no. it off without destroying See, it. See, that's what we need Danny. Danny's line is no. No. <laughs> <That's what laughs> no. I'm going to get him a shirt for SEMA that just says no. I am your no man. So um, he can, he can he can wear that around. Well, no, time. and then not included. Yeah. Yeah. Back. <laughs> but this is just a simple procedure. So, I mean, it, it's a it's a workflow. It's a chart. It's mm -hmm. something that any estimator, body shop owner, or adjuster can apply to any car that they're looking at. Yep. I go through these steps first. Mm -hmm. I cover the science. I cover the procedures. If I don't check any no boxes here, then I go to here and I make a financial decision. So, I, I want to be very clear to shop owners. You always have the ability to make a financial adjustment for the benefit of what you feel is a relationship with an insurer, be of that course. a DRP agreement or not, or make a financial decision for a customer that comes in and says, I'm on a fixed budget or whatever. You can never, ever make a safety decision. Mm -mm. So if we go through those boxes and we check it off and I cannot replace that panel per the OE, it's out of the question, period. At that point, it's not about finances, it's not about labor, it's not about the technician's willingness to do it, it's off the table. Yep. So I can, I can never negotiate someone's safety or liability. No. I ever. think anytime you want to make a business decision, financial or whatever, call your lawyer. Ask your lawyer, can he, can he defend this? I call up my lawyer all the time when I do stuff, and I was like, hey, can you defend this? Yeah. Okay. Can you defend this? No, it's probably not a good idea. All right, I'm going to do it anyway. But, um, <laughs> you know, you have to you, you, have, you, know. to, you have to get a professional right. to really tell you what you can and can't do. You, you know, uh, Eric and I talked about it at the trade show this weekend um, about hold harmless and stuff like that, that they're not going to hold up in court. They're not going to work. Um, there's a major issue with she's been involved in cases before with those you, you really got to talk to your lawyer and guys just write this stuff up guys and girls in the, in the business write it up think they're lawyers or they go and the, and the dumbest thing is you ask a, you're not even asking I, I'm not happy about some of these you know repair questions being asked on some of these groups uh, because they don't want to look up the repair information but the biggest thing is is that when they ask you know accounting insurance uh, coverage or you know for like their own personal business or, or legal questions on a page where it's just collision repairs instead of go call your own lawyer go call yeah. your own accountant go call yeah. your own insurance broker and find out what these yeah, coverages probably shouldn't are. ask legal advice on a technician forum. yeah no and then, <laughs> and then you got these other idiots that want to play like you know I legal got eagle YouTube technician degree yep. and my facebook law degree yep. yes <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I, yes. I um, no and i spent 20 years in court all the time i mean i guess when you, when you work for a large insurer you end up in the courtroom awful lot you i know so much about lot. law that i know enough to ask somebody who has a good degree on their wall that says i'm a lawyer yeah that's what I know about law. Yeah. Just yep. like accounting. I know, you know, you, we don't do our own taxes, which is just basic math. And if you actually read it, you can probably figure it out. And you don't want to go to jail or get, you know, find money. So what do you do? You go to somebody and pay them a couple hundred bucks to do your taxes it's for you so you don't wind up in jail. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, and, and, and that's the biggest thing you got to look at. I mean, look, the OEM has, we don't make them, we don't sell them, we don't wreck them. 
We fix them. Yeah. And the OEM has different procedures for it. And I don't know why so many people want to circumvent what the OEM says. And we wind up with this a lot. We hear this a lot in uh, classes and online and even, you know, even questions we get on this show sometimes. The OEM has procedures. There's a reason for it. There's a certain construction to the car. There's a certain way they put the car together. Mm -hmm. There's a certain process of safety items. I mean, look. I mean, this 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 argument would probably be over if it had an ADA, uh, ADAS system yep. of some sort of sensor, which would be. And I'm just gonna get up for a quick second. Right someplace right over here, yep. mounted. And yep. let's just say the quarter had a dent here. Yep. Well, that totally rules out the quarter because the sensor mounts right here. I mean, Toyota and Honda put sensors well, here now in their newer cars. I'm going to say that it rules it out for us. It would not rule. I still believe that even if I had an, if I had a blind spot monitoring system on that, that quarter panel, I would still be having to have a dialogue with an insurance adjuster and their mm -hmm. manager on why I can't use a used and quarter. And you know. there's a little bit more proof there yep. on this car that's you know basically yep. stripped down, which is no different than probably a Chevy, which is probably no different than a Toyota. You know, they're similarly built, they're similar, similar materials, they're similar attachment methods. I'm not talking Mopar, which well bonds, or, or Benz, or Audi, or Paul. I'm just talking those three major companies mm -hmm. out there. This quarter panel difference here still wouldn't be cost effective on any one of those three cars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and this is really just the why. Yeah. We, the we why. know what, what is, you're not going to do it, and here's the why. Yep. Yep, and it just puts you in a better, if you sit down with somebody and explain the why, it mm -hmm. makes the decision to change the mind, whatever, you're still yeah. going to get some no's, you're still going to sure. get some... Some I, we have some here going on in Arkansas where even the Department of Insurance has said, "Oh, well, used is all you owe." Mm -hmm. Not really, but I guess we're gonna have to go to court and figure that out. Right. So um, that's that's what judges and juries decide. So we'll we'll get there. So the bottom line is what you had today was just a walkthrough of what we're thinking of when we've been saying follow the science of the panel, don't follow the position statements. If we're going to be repair professionals, we need to explain the why we want to or not want to do something versus trying to use a shield. Mm -hmm. to, to push it through. If you can't explain the why, it kind of scares me no matter what yep. side of this fence you're on. Um, makes me a little nervous. Uh, next month is going to be fantastic. I'm going to fair warn you, next month's show will go approximately two hours. We are going to completely blueprint a car, start to finish, tear down, mirror matching, um, damaged parts on the parts car. We will be scanning the car. We will be pre-measuring the car. We will go through kind of our entire blueprinting process. So, so if we you get the bubble wrap too? Because I want to get the bubble wrap. I want to pop the yep. bubble wrap. Yep. <laughs> you can pop the bubble wrap. You cannot touch the monkey. No monkey. I can't. No monkey in the <laughs> show. Monkey. No, the monkey's got to be there to help me. Who's the monkey? Helped me measure the car the last time. I uh, know, monkey's out. <laughs> so, um, but this show is going to be great. If you've ever thought about implementing a complete blueprinting process in your shop, or you have one now and you feel like like it's got some holes in it. This is going to be great. We're going to have guests with us um, from Matrix. Uh, we're going to talk Go about on. the wand and we're yeah. going to play with that a little bit. We have the uh, touch from Carliner that we'll be um, putting in as we do blueprinting as well. Um, we've got Mitchell joining us with the scan tool and we'll be talking about um, how they are tether free on scanning plus estimating in the same tool. Um, so we'll be covering lots of different things in this episode for blueprinting, letting shops decide what works for them. We highly encourage you block off the time yep. um, and that you come prepared to ask some questions. So we're going to have a lot of guests in the studio next month, uh, people with different expertise and different levels. Kind of, uh, we'll be it's passing. Be fun. Up, yeah, it's yeah, be fun. We'll be, be passing up a time. I'm going to give you two different versions uh, of the blueprinting process. One utilizing uh, um, some of that quick, fast, and, mm -hmm. and you know, significant damage where you have three different categories, or uh, how to utilize certain equipment just to measure a car or diagnose a car mm -hmm. in a, 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 just a set area inside the shop, a spot inside the shop, a work bay, or uh, even outside on a nicer day where you can just do it outside real quick, or even some eye wash to make the customer look happy where you can take some of these measuring tools and show something and say, hey, look, this car's really not safe to drive with yeah. two uh, quick measurements. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, ah, and they go, oh, wow, wow, that's pretty <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. And it's like, look, this car's really not safe to drive. I mean, the whole nose is off. Here, let me show you this. And you can take something like the Carolina tool, the Matrix, and go out there and yep. snap a picture or take a couple of measurements and go, look, oh, wow, I, oh, okay, yeah, let me leave the car. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that can really help out a lot of people. And uh, something with the Matrix, tricks on quick measurements or even with the car liner, we can show you that a lot of the damage assessors can learn that within a day or two because you're not really doing a heavy diagnosis, just taking some quick measurements yeah. versus maybe using something like the vision on yeah. a machine. So, so it, we're going to try and show your, that. Your, your blueprinting technician no longer has to be an A-tech, you know, oh. have to worry about a frame tech or getting involved and so all that. And we're definitely going to run you through that process. Also, do not forget, next week is the OE live show. We'll be with BMW. Yep. Um, and we got a lot of, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, live show. Yeah, you got it. Come on. Monkey. Okay. He's going to be in the show. <laughs>
It's my show. We will be giving away the monkey on no, the next episode. That's no, my show. <laughs> uh, but no, so this week, Thursday, if you have not registered for QC Live with Larry, Larry's going to take you through a four hour class on in, in process QC, how to make sure a car that's repaired improperly never makes it out your door so that it doesn't come back to you on court. Um, or that it doesn't make it to your detail bay and then you have to start the whole repair process all over yeah. again. So that class is Thursday, Live QC. You can still sign up on the website. And then next week is OE Live with BMW. BMW. Yep. So mm -hmm. it's going to be exciting. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions, you can always reach us on the website.